Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Ressa. Joining us today is Carly Nice. She's a human rights lawyer and a technology expert who's been working with an international coalition of researchers on something that they call patriotic trolling. Carly, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Maria. So how do you define patriotic trolling? What is it? So patriotic trolling is a, a kind of loose term that has emerged um, to describe the, when states play a hand in online harassment campaigns. And the reason we use the term patriotic trolling is not to kind of denigrate patriotism or, or um, take a negative approach to those that want to support their country, but rather to try to get at something really um, quite pernicious that we see that happens with these attacks, which is that states um, are trying to distance themselves from online trolling attacks against dissidents and critics by um, explaining them um, using kind of um, the excuse of patriotism. They're saying, actually, we have nothing to do with this. This is an organic movement. The people are speaking out on social media. The people are um, making their, their opinions heard. And this is not a state related activity. But actually, when uh, in the analysis that we've done, we can see there's very clear ties to state bodies, both in an explicit way. So we see some countries setting up um, organizations specifically designed to attack and harass online and in some ways a more implicit way we see an arm's length role of the state where the government will use um, proxies in the media um, or they'll retweet or um, reiterate things that happen online um, so it's really a, a kind of a swarm um, or a really amorphous l network where the government is at one end and the attack is at the other and the connections are often hard to draw. So we're trying to, to um, look at the phenomena in the round and that's why we've taken the word patriotic trolling um, to describe this set of activities. Um, and can you give us a, how many countries is this happening? What are the most sure. prominent? So we've seen, we've been studying it in around um, 20 cases over about 15 different countries. Um, and we've seen um, similar uh, patterns of activity in really disparate country contexts. So from um, Ecuador and Venezuela, Turkey, Russia, Azerbaijan, um, and then the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, China, uh, Iran, um, really quite widespread. Um, and we've seen patterns emerging across those different countries. So to give you some kind of highlights of those patterns, usually we see um, these type of attacks taking place on social media. There's quite often the use of bots um, and we can come back to that. So um, governments are deploying um, automated social media messaging to create a, a feeling of um, overwhelming numbers and, and um, a groundswell, if you will. Um, we see attacks mostly directed at journalists and activists, um, those that speak out against the status quo, really. Um, we see uh, attacks using really violent language, misogynistic language, um, designed really to intimidate um, critics of the government and to silence them. We see quite often um, the use of claims of affiliation with foreign intelligence agencies. That's quite a, a common um, uh, a tactic used. And then we see uh, online attacks often accompanied by offline attacks, um, phone calls, um, uh, protests, the use of um, hashtag spamming. So um, when, for example, a journalist is inundated with uh, a particular hashtag and then others um, supporting that attack all jump on board. Um, and we've seen quite often um, these attacks taking place in and around elections and then in the aftermath of elections, uh, governments using the same infrastructure that they built up uh, for the campaign to continue to uh, bring down critics of the government afterwards. And from what you've seen, why is this a human rights concern? Certainly, patriotic trolling attacks are designed to really undermine the right to freedom of expression. And um, they do that in a number of ways. Primarily, they attack the media and they attack pluralistic and diverse media voices. Um, and of course, the right to, um, of the media to, to participate in the political life of a country is enshrined in human rights and the right of individuals to receive um, diverse and um, different uh, media perspectives. Um, is really inherently connected to our right to freedom of expression. And what these state-sponsored um, harassment campaigns are designed to do is to remove that pluralism, to remove the diversity from the media, to homogenize 
um, the media culture and in order to give us the impression that there's only one story and that is the government story. Um, and it also is um, creating an atmosphere of, of fear and repression in these countries where people don't feel that they can speak out and make their voices heard. Um, it's, these attacks are often also accompanied by um, monitoring and surveillance as well. In some countries, we've seen governments hacking individuals to support campaigns, harassment campaigns. And that, of course, really goes right to the heart of, of individuals' right to privacy as well. So I think across the board, what patriotic trolling is doing is it's it's undermining the ability of us to use the internet in a way that's co coherent and and reinforcing of our of our free expression rights. And in that respect, this is really kind of a weaponization of technology against individuals. Um, when this technology was meant to be here to reinforce and help us exercise our human rights. Um, and that's really the concern that we have as researchers and, and observers of this. Another common theme seems to be uh, an attack on women. Could you describe, you, just, you talked Absolutely. about misogyny. How does, the, why women and, and what have you seen? Absolutely. I, in countries from um, Ecuador to, to Turkey to the Philippines, your own experience, we've really seen that women are overwhelmingly this, the target of these attacks. And um, that means that these attacks are often centered on extremely violent and mis misogynistic language. We see women journalists being subject to um, rape threats, death threats, um, really violent imagery. Um, and, and often it's quite easy to draw the links back to a government actor um, in, instituting those attacks. As for the reason behind that, um, I think that unfortunately misogyn misogyny remains widespread throughout the world and it is a, a convenient and easy weapon to use against, um, against women journalists and women activists. Um, and it plays, I think, also on a group mentality that exists often on these social media platforms. Um, one of the, I think, motivating factors why we see trolling attacks as being such an effective tool of state repression is that it really, uh, it leans on this online disinhibition effect where individuals, because they're online, they, they will do things or say things that they might not necessarily do or say in real life. And we see actually that governments are, uh, are weaponizing this this trend and using it uh, to their own advantage. So I think that that's why we we see these misogynistic attacks happening online as well, because they play on an individual's, um, uh, I don't know, tendency to, to to air their more deeply hidden and misogynistic tendencies by encouraging them to do it on social media platforms. It like it fans the worst of human nature, I guess, Indeed. in that sense. Right. Have Indeed. you seen, what are the most effective ways of dealing with this? Well, I think that, Maria, one of the things that I've been, I've noticed when doing this research is it does fan the worst of the human behavior in a way, but also we 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 don't have to entirely blame individuals. I think that the, the technologies are designed in a way to promote this type of activity and to enhance it. Um, so, you know, the algorithms underpinning many of the social media platforms that we use are designed to promote and to give more attention to uh, the type of content that draws attention, that keeps individuals' attention and engagement. And that content is often the most obscene, the most shocking content. Um, so the, the technologies themselves encourage the promotion of this behavior. Um, and I think that um, in terms of tactics and techniques in order to try to stem the use of technology to this end, it really has to begin in or at least involve the platforms themselves and, and that starts with the recognition that these are not neutral technologies that can be um, used for good or for evil depending on the individual but in fact there is a lot embedded in the way technology is designed um, that uh, it makes these types of attacks more likely to happen so I think um, the conversation has to involve Google, Facebook, Twitter and others and, and really um, encourage them to do some soul searching about um, how can they change the design of these platforms to limit the likelihood of patriotic trolling. One um, potential measure that could be taken quite easily, I think, would be to help individuals identify when a, a tweet is coming from a bot or a real person. And the reason that that's so important is um, not only to 
I, I think minimize the prevalence of bots on on these websites, but also to minimize their impact um, on on an individual. We've seen through these cases that people who are attacked through patriotic tolling attacks often feel so overwhelmed because it seems like an organic groundswell where all these people are turning against them. But it, once you recognize that a large percentage of those people are actually bots, it does um, somehow dilute the um, personal uh, injury that um, victims feel from these attacks. So I think encouraging platforms to work towards simply identifying when um, a social media post comes from a bot is one quite easy technological fix that would help to minimize their, their impact. You know, we actually built a tool for us and our social media team so that we can tell the difference between uh, between a bot, between those that are cut and paste and real people who we want to engage with. So, yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Just knowing that is really helpful. But, you know, it's interesting because you mentioned Google, Facebook, Twitter. These are American companies and the irony of American companies actually helping uh, kill democracy. I mean, mm. you, you're using very, your language is is uh, in a way where what are their responsibilities? You know, isn't yeah. shouldn't there be more done on the platform's end? I absolutely think there should be, Maria. I think the problem is that you see these companies grew out of a well-intentioned um, um, and very American commitment to free speech um, in a very American way, which is that um, um, speech is king above all, and the way to counter hate speech and violent speech is more speech. And um, that, that comes from a Silicon Valley ideology and it works in some context. But when you take that global, I think we've seen the limitations of that approach. And I think that um, actually it is time for them to recognize that um, just because a technology designed in a particular country in a particular political context um, works in that context, it doesn't mean it will work internationally. Um, and even then, I think we're seeing the limitations of it in the US, for example. I mean, it's clear that those same platforms became a vehicle for, for um, election abuse in 2016. And, and I think now it, it is a wake up call for them to move beyond uh, a position where they feel that they're a neutral technology and neutral platform encouraging free speech to actually realizing that they're, um, they may be a mechanism for evil as well as good in countries like uh, the Philippines and many others around the world, and um, to try to start working towards a, a more, uh, I don't know, um, bespoke approach to different country contexts as well. I think the challenge for them is how do they stay tr true to their, their principles and policies as well, and they are clearly um, there to promote free speech. They don't want to become a mechanism for censorship, and that is the very complex balance that I, ha I think has to be made. Um, we don't want to see these platforms, for example, requiring identification at every step of the way because that might prevent other individuals who want to who want to use uh, their tools anonymously from doing so um, we don't want to see them um, pr you know requiring pre-approval of content because that may become a tool for censorship in and of itself so um, I think the balance needs to be struck these places are populated with very smart people and I think that they can they can rise to that challenge. But I think really it, it requires them admitting that they have to take action first. From what you've seen and the, the kinds of attacks uh, that, that you've studied, uh, it, can we draw a line between free speech and inciting to violence or inciting to hate? Is that something possible? I think that it, it absolutely is. International human rights law has a, has a framework for, for um, isolating that very small category of speech, which is hate speech amounting to incitement and, and says international law says that you should criminalise that and you should prevent that speech. I think the problem is that it can be a, a subjective or it's, many people feel that it is, a, it is a subjective analysis and I think actually we can make it an objective analysis. We all know the difference between um, an offensive tweet and a tweet which actually uh, suggests that someone may come to harm and I think it, you would struggle to find anyone who doesn't think that that speech should be somehow controlled. I think the problem is that when we're talking about cross-jurisdictional flows of information um, where you have the company, as you said, in America, you have the action occurring in the Philippines or Australia or, or Iran, um, the question is who makes the decision? Who is the arbiter of what is hate speech, what is um, illegal content? Um, and 
many people don't want governments to be in charge of that because yeah. they feel that the governments will use it for their own end. Correct. Um, on the other hand, do we, we want Google and Facebook to, to be in charge of um, what many people feel uncomfortable about that as well because it won't necessarily connect to the cultural um, realities in a particular circumstance, for example. So I think that's the challenge that we're facing in that conversation at the moment. My personal view is that given the you know ascendancy of these companies, it has to be them who ultimately makes those decisions yeah. and they can do that in a way that's transparent and accountable by bringing in civil society voices, bringing in the media, you know, starting a conversation and then enforcing those decisions. But I think we're still a long way from them, um, you know, really feeling comfortable in that role. And, and that's probably the role of activists and others to push for that. Um, in terms of the irony, of course, is that the, in, by fighting for freedom of speech, the, the platforms actually do choose preferred speech. Their algorithms choose what to distribute. Right. And uh, this fight for freedom of speech is actually stifling freedom of speech in, in our part of the world, at least. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I guess I, I know that, you know, the Philippines, in that landscape of everything of the other countries you've studied, where do, where do we fit in, in in what you've seen? So I think the Philippines is a fascinating um, context with you know the large majority of the country on Facebook and actually research I've seen says that a small majority, something like 10% view, view Facebook as the internet one and the same. They don't know the difference between Facebook and the internet. I think that that's, you know, it's, it is a digital society in many respects um, um, and one in which media and communication are very closely embedded. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that held, that idea held a lot of promise in the Philippines and it's obviously led to, to many benefits. But we've seen, I think, Duterte has really flipped that on its head in so many ways um, throughout the election last year and, and now in, in governing um, has, has been quite an astute user of social media and, uh, you know, arguably an astute perpetrator of patriotic trolling. Um, to to actually manipulate Filipinos' uh, use and, and and technological savvy um, to to turn it against kind of journalists like rap uh, media outlets like Rappler and others who've spoken out against him and um, you know I think we've seen the patriotic trolling patterns elsewhere we've seen them play out very clearly in in the Philippines as well um, using um, using this kind of point and shoot method where uh, Duterte or others will call out a journalist or a critic and then the trolls will convene and converge around this person and um, inundate them with uh, harassing and, and violent, often violent language. We've seen the, you know, the, the elevation of prominent bloggers to positions within the government. Um, we've also seen arguably the government use uh, commercial companies and outsiders to assist with these types of campaigns. So I think actually, in in many ways, Philipp the Philippines is an archetypal example of how governments kind of weaponize technology to serve their own ends, um, and 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 I think that that's a really concerning thing in a country that's so um, highly reliant on these technologies to have them used against them is is disempowering, but also quite frightening, and and I think the argument for why these technology companies should take a strong stance is is at its clearest in the Philippines, in fact. Fantastic. And I guess, uh, Carly, your, your last thoughts on this. I mean, the study has been done. Um, you've talked about how the platforms can can take steps forward. There are now, uh, uh, there's there are hearings being conducted in the United States into geopolitical players. Um, where yeah. do you see this going? I think that, um, I feel that there's a groundswell towards putting pressure on technology companies to take steps and we've spoken about that and I hope that, that continues. I think that we are also seeing some changes around electoral regulation and I think that that's quite important, recognising that things that happen on the internet are not outside of normal electoral re regulations about how much money can be spent and in what ways and I think um, that's that's an, something that we should also push forward. And then I think finally, <clears throat> recognizing that this is actually a, a state uh, perpetrated activity and 
starting to think about a normative framework within which we can think about that. So we already know that states use cyber attacks against other countries, but what does it mean when states use cyber attacks against their own people? And how should we think about that in terms of international law and international human rights um, to start to you know, get some some justice in that field. So I think, you know, this is a, a type of issue that it feels like every week there's some new development, some new revelation. So we're really in the thick of trying to respond to it. Um, and hopefully research like this can support um, some, some changes. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thanks. Carly. Uh, we were speaking with Thanks, Carly Naish, human rights lawyer, technology expert. Thanks for joining us.